tidy up here. Uh, I'm P.J. Crowley, a former Assistant Secretary of State, a fellow at the George Washington University Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. Are we okay? Good. Um, okay, I'll start again. Uh, I'm P.J. Crowley, a former Assistant Secretary of State, a fellow at the George Washington Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication, a member of the Aspen Homeland Security Group, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce this next panel on counterterrorism and countering violent extremism. You know, based on the discussion so far, there appears to be a consensus that the United States has an important stake in this challenge and a role to play, but will not be the most credible messenger. There is also consensus that the most credible messengers will come from the Middle East and the Islamic world. But we continue to struggle to establish the proper context for this struggle. Without that, it's difficult to craft effective messaging. There is an undeniable religious context to this struggle. Secretary Johnson is right in my view that we should avoid using the term Islamic extremism, both because it undermines the partnership we must establish with Muslim communities in this country and around the world, but also because by throwing all of these malign actors in one bucket, we blur the important distinctions, for example, between the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, distinctions that are critical to defeating them. We learned during the Cold War how lumping all adversaries through a single lens of communist, we failed to understand fundamental differences among Moscow, Beijing, and Hanoi. That failure had, had profound strategic consequence. A great religion is being hijacked. There are competing visions regarding what the religion represents and what actions are justified in the name of religion. To me, a better context is to call this a war within Islam. It is multidimensional across the full spectrum of conflict. It is about the Islamic State, but also about the Muslim Brotherhood and many different elements in between both Shia and Sunni. It is not just military, it is political. It is about bombs and ideas. It is not primarily about us. It is about them although we have a vital interest in how this civil war is resolved. To the extent the Islamic State has surpassed other movements to become the principal protagonist and threat to delegitimize and defeat ISIL, we need to understand its messaging and its appeal, to what extent it is about a caliphate and offering a false sense of belonging to disaffected Muslims, particularly young Muslims, to what extent is it about the relationship between the Islamic world and the modern world, encouraging Muslims to reject and strike out at the West, including the United States? To what extent is it about the success of ISIL and its ability to not just survive, but to govern territory at least as well, if not better than others, particularly the government in Baghdad? And to what extent is it about the raw appeal of violence or belief that violence is the only answer or is justified by the perversion of religion or history, which we have seen recently in Chattanooga and also in a different context in Charleston. To advance our understanding of these issues, we have a great panel and to lead the discussion, I'll turn it over to Chris Isham, Vice President and Washington Bureau Chief for CBS News, who has himself deep experience in covering the evolution of this struggle over the past two decades. Chris. Thank you, PJ. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, this is a, as PJ noted, this is an important topic, and it's one that has been, uh, interestingly, a uh, recurring theme in a number of the speakers uh, over the past couple of days. Uh, FBI Director Jim Comey said that uh, ISIS has now replaced Al-Qaeda as the dominant threat to the United States, and that this is largely because of its power in social media, its ability to spread its message through Twitter and other social media platforms. The estimates are up to 90,000 Twitter messages a day are being transmitted about ISIS, and uh, there are approximately 50,000 followers of ISIS, and according to the FBI director, 20,000 alone in English language uh, followers. So these are, these are serious numbers. <clears throat> this is a 
I think we can only call it a new digital battle space. Uh, it's connected to the actual battle space, clearly, um, but it is a battle that is being played out, a battle of ideas and a battle uh, of media. So um, with that, let me introduce our, our distinguished panel. Um, Starting from the far left, Juliet Kayem, who's founder of Kayem Solutions and a former Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security uh, for Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, she's also associated with the Kennedy School at Harvard. <clears throat> um, and to her right is Gilles de Koshov, who is the Counterterrorism Coordinator for the European Union. And to his right, the one and only Jane Harmon, uh, who I think you all know, who is director, president, and CEO of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And on my immediate left, Rashad Hussein, who is the special envoy and special coordinator for strategic counterterrorism communications for the Department of State, <clears throat> which is quite a mouthful. Uh, so um, let's begin uh, with Rashad. Um, the, recently, your boss, Rick Stengel, um, wrote a memo to his boss, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry, saying uh, that effectively our narrative is being trumped by ISIL. Uh, it was a grim picture of, of, of a debate that's been going on about the effectiveness of our strategic communications against terrorism. Others have weighed in along these lines. Your predecessor, uh, Mr. Fernandez, who was interviewed, said that uh, the response to ISIS has been limited and weak. Uh, and you know the criticisms. Uh, Mr. Stengel has subsequently written an op-ed this morning which uh, tries to take a slightly <clears throat> more positive uh, look at the picture. But, but I don't think there's no question that we're up against a, a, a fairly formidable uh, digital operation here. Tell me a little bit about your center, uh, what kinds of things you're doing. I understand that, that there's some, some new initiatives that you've launched. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to the Aspen Institute for putting together uh, this incredible uh, event and especially on such an important set of issues, uh, including countering violent extremism. Uh, this is a formidable challenge. Um, I come into this role uh, new as somebody that uh, has been working in the administration, has traveled extensively in the Muslim world, has heard directly uh, from Muslim audiences, someone who has grown up uh, in, a, in a Muslim family and, and understands the tradition uh, with the background, uh, including um, uh, Arabic and memorization of the Quran and familiarity with texts that uh, these groups are using uh, and taking out of context to get their, uh, their message out there. And the challenge that we're facing is while uh, the world has rejected uh, ISIL's uh, narrative and particularly their tactics, uh, including Muslims all around the world, they are able uh, to resonate with a slice uh, of the population, a disaffected slice of the population uh, around the world by uh, playing on, on grievances. Um, and, and these are grievances that individuals have against other governments. They're grievances that individuals have against their own governments. And they're grievances oftentimes that individuals have against themselves. You'll, you'll see cases where uh, there's individuals that have what they perceive to be spiritual in, in, imperfections and terrorists exploit that, they say, in order to cleanse that. Uh, you need to take uh, this path in the way of God and, and, and clear yourself by engaging uh, in, in these acts of violence. And they're able to do this in a way, while it is a small slice of the population, they're recruiting, remember, from 1.6 billion people around the world. And they offer a sense of empowerment, they offer a sense of purpose, they offer a sense of meaning. Um, and so what we have to do is we have to make sure that we are not only uh, providing uh, a positive vision and that Muslim communities around the world are providing uh, positive alternatives to what they're calling people to do, which is to come and establish so-called uh, uh, Islamic State. But we have to make sure that we're providing counter narratives that are, that are effective. And, and we've uh, taken uh, the, uh, an approach uh, that has shifted uh, our strategy in a couple of different ways. First of all, uh, we are, we're revamping uh, our messaging since I came into this role to make sure that we are emphasizing that these groups are actually doing more damage to Islam and Muslims. They claim to be the defenders of Sunni Islam. They say that Sunnis are under attack in Syria. They say Sunnis are under attack uh, in Iraq and that you have to come and defend these lands. Well, actually, Sunni Muslims are the, are the largest victims uh, of their terrorism. 
and we have to make sure that we're clear about the fact that they're doing damage more to, to Muslim communities than anyone else. We have to amplify the stories of defectors um, and former radicals who at some point have bought into this ideology and come back and say, what I was doing and what I was told to do was nothing what, as what was advertised. Uh, you know, I was engaged in killing innocent people. Uh, women were held as slaves and brutalized and raped. And when we amplify those stories, we start to put seeds of doubt into the minds of those that may be on the fence. And more importantly, perhaps we prevent people from ever getting to the point where they're on the fence. We have to amplify the fact that there, have been, uh, there has been resistance to ISIS and that there have been some successes on the battlefield, particularly in Iraq, where we've regained 25 to 30 percent of the territory which they've acquired. We have to amplify the living conditions under ISIL. No electricity, no water in some of these places. They p paint a picture of what life is like in Mosul or what life is like in other parts of uh, of, of, uh, of, their, uh, uh, of the region, uh, but we have to be clear about what's actually ha happening there. Um, and we also have to amplify credible voices, not just religious leaders, but those who have been subject to, to rule under ISIL and those who have seen uh, what it's like to be brutalized um, in their rule, under their rule. Um, and so we've taken this approach, which is more factual and testimonial in nature, which we feel is an appropriate place for the U.S. government. Now, there are others out there that will directly uh, get into the more normative or uh, religious aspects of the ideology. Um, that's not necessarily the best place for the United States but, government. But, so we're but, working. But could you talk a little bit about what specifically your center is doing? Sure. Uh, so one aspect of it is there is direct uh, engagement on social media platforms. Now, a lot of people know about what we're doing in English, and I talked about the shift that we've made. I think before there was sometimes um, a satire used, and there was um, but this kind isn't of this like, my, my name is Bob, and I work at the State Department, and <laughs> yeah. you guys really don't have this right. Is, yeah. that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, there, yeah. well, there is a sense of, there is a sense of, you know, there is tweeting directly at terrorists. There is a sense of some of the messages being satirical in nature. And so part of the shift is to focus on the areas which I've spoken about, the more factual and testimonial areas, and doing that not only in English, which a lot of people see, but in social media platforms, in Somali, uh, in Urdu, in Arabic. And then the second uh, part of the strategy, which I, which I want to talk about a little bit, is working with partners overseas to make sure that they are amplifying these messages and also getting into aspects of the debate, which are kind of the more uh, normative or religious they in nature, they can counter that. fusion center with the uh, UAE. So and one of the partners that we worked with, the UAE, we had this uh, notion um, earlier this year, last year, uh, that there's other countries in the world and other, non more importantly, non-governmental organizations in the world that are uh, outraged by what ISIL is doing. And other countries and other partners need to step up as well. This is not the, just the United States against ISIL. This is the world against ISIL, and particularly, um, as PJ was talking about, the Muslim world against ISIL. And sometimes they will be the most credible voices on this. So working with the government of UAE, we've set up uh, a center, the Sawab Center, which in Arabic means uh, uh, the right way, and we're working with other governments. One model is to have a joint U.S. Uh, relationship at the governmental level, but another model is to have governments do things on their own. Another model is to have non-governmental entities getting these messages out there. So this is a generational challenge. It's a formidable struggle. We didn't get here overnight. Part of the challenge is that this ideology has been building up over time, and we have to understand why some people are attracted to this ideology, this notion of the khilafah or the, or the caliphate. There's a romantic notion that many Muslims around the world have going back to the early caliphs in Islam. Of course, those Caliphs are nothing like what Baghdadi is, who claims to be uh, you know, the caliph. And 122 of the most prominent Muslims around the world wrote a letter to Baghdadi saying, you aren't uh, the caliph, and what you're doing is wrong. Uh, but there is that notion of a romantic notion of Muslim unity um, that they try to tap into and appeal to. There, is, there are grievances, as I said. They, they're grievance, policy grievances, and some of them are based on misunderstanding. Well, let's, feeling, let's, come, let's come back to that yeah. in a minute. Uh, I'd like to just uh, hear from Jane for a moment. You wrote an op-ed recently in the uh, Washington Post, um, and the gist of which was, we simply must do better on this score. Um, and one of the, the couple of areas you, you suggested working with was uh, focusing on some of the skill sets that we've seen deployed in political campaigns, targeting uh, certain people, and also uh, the technology sector. Could you talk a little bit about where you see, where, where we might be able to tap into, into those efforts? Well, let me first uh, congratulate the State Department on hiring Rashid. Uh, he brings skills that, 
they, we, our nation, our world needs. And uh, I think what he's doing is extremely worthy. But I don't think the State Department, regardless of hiring 1,000 Rashids, is going to make the sale. And that's what my op-ed says. It, it basically says that um, uh, in the technology space where uh, the US government is lagging, and I don't think anybody would argue, I don't think Rashid would argue, uh, the way to make the sale is through skills that uh, the political sector has and that our government sector really doesn't have. Uh, think the Obama campaign in 2012 and think the campaigns of uh, most everybody, all 100 people running for president in, in 2016. Uh, they slice and dice the electorate. They know exactly who they need to reach, what states they're in, uh, and basically ignore the rest of us, or at least that's how I feel. Uh, but they, whoops, that's what happens. They are uh, targeting, micro-targeting those people with messages on media that those people will respond to. And I don't think we're close in delivering the right messages to the right people. We need to intersect those people before they decide to engage in violent acts. Uh, the FBI and law enforcement, our JTTFs, are doing a good job of finding some of those people. And we really should <coughs> congratulate them for doing that. Um, but more people have been wrapped up than work in the State Department on this effort. So let's understand how big the problem is. So my suggestion is uh, the government should uh, encourage, should lead from behind. This is a place where leading from behind really works. And encourage the private sector uh, directly or through public-private partnerships to step up and do the things that the private sector in this country does brilliantly. Who invented the internet? Who is inventing these startups that find just that niche that can reach you and figure out what you want before you even know you wanted it? Who does these pop-ups that are so annoying on, <laughs> to me uh, on my phone or these other targeted messages where I'm pushed to want something? Uh, this is where, this is the technology of, of making the argument. And let me just make another piece. It's not just, although I think we have to win the war of ideas. We have to win the war of ideas, but we also have to win the war. And in that sense, it's very uh, encouraging uh, today to learn uh, that we have worked out a deal with the government of Turkey uh, so that we can base planes on two bases in Turkey, which will give us a significant lift in the air war uh, against ISIL in the Middle East. It will also um, hopefully scare the heck out of some of these groups operating there because obviously everybody understands how capable we are, but now we will have the, the, the option of doing a lot more. And so I think that's a piece of it. Another piece of it is that John Kerry and Ash Carter um, are, well, Ash is in the region, but John Kerry's going in a week or two uh, to meet with uh, the Gulf states. Ash Carter's meeting with Israel and then with Saudi Arabia. And they're talking about uh, this coalition effort that makes all the difference, uh, both in pushing back against Iran's uh, proxy terror groups, but also in pushing against ISIL. And to the extent that we can start to make significant visible progress in the war uh, against ISIL, our narrative gets much more effective. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Gilles, uh, as a representative from EU, uh, Europe has been particularly hard hit by extremism. You have uh, more foreign fighters coming from Europe than certainly from this country. Uh, you've had the attacks at our Charlie Hebdo and elsewhere. Um, so you really are at ground zero in many ways of this, uh, of this problem. Uh, tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, what the kinds of initiatives the EU is interested in pursuing in, in combating this. Indeed, uh, a, a real threat. F more than 5,000 uh, foreign fight uh, citizens of Europe left uh, for Syria and Iraq, uh, which is huge. And uh, we have not managed to stem the flow so far. We've done a lot, but not enough. And it, just to, 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 to discuss what, what uh, you raised, the, uh, the role of internet, the common knowledge before was that you could not be radicalized on internet, just on internet. You need an interaction, a face-to-face -face interaction. This is no longer true. We have teenagers um, in f 15 days who get radicalized, take a plane, and go to Turkey. So we have to do something about this. And after the Paris attack, indeed, heads of state and government 
have taken several decisions, and uh, we'll just concentrate on, on, on Internet. By the way, uh, satellite TV plays also a major role, and we are not looking at this enough. Uh, on Internet, the, the idea is exactly what Jane said, to uh, develop a public-private uh, partnership with the IT companies. Uh, we would like to launch by the end of this year a sort of forum to discuss uh, several aspects of Internet. One is to identify more content. The second is to remove uh, illegal content. The third is the counter narrative, and the, the fourth one is to access content. The first one, it's an issue that was raised uh, this week by Prime Minister Cameron, uh, is to what extent we would like the internet companies to do the job themselves. So far, they mostly rely on the users to flag distasteful content, and, uh, and that works. Uh, we are currently setting up a unit at Europol, which is our FBI, where trained people do flag illegal content to the companies, based on the uh, British experience where a special unit inside Scotland Yard do flag illegal content. And Google told us that when it's people from that unit, and they are specially trained to, to, to see the, 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 the difference between illegal content and distasteful content, uh, Google removed them in 93% of the time. When you and I, we do the same, we flag, and you can, you have a button, it only happens in 33% of the time. Why is it so? Because we may have different views on what is illegal and what is distasteful. So we have decided to set up a, a By team. By illegal, you really mean uh, not in compliance with the policies of that particular internet. That's company. a good point. Yeah. Uh, we have a definition of terrorism, and it's difficult to, to really delineate what is illegal and, and not legal. So, so far, um, the first step is to just rely on the terms and conditions of the IT companies. So they take themselves the decision. Uh, we, some of our members say would like to go further and just rely on the decision by the state to inject, give an injunction uh, to the companies to remove the content. Uh, so that's the first step, and it's a good step. But we would like the companies to do that more themselves. If you take YouTube has removed, I think, 14 million videos in 2014, and they get 190,000 uh, flags a day, which is huge. Twitter does that a lot, a, a, a lot less, and, and they, do, they don't do the job themselves. And what Cameron said in his speech this week, he said um, their business model is, is precisely based on their capability to um, process data, extract data, and sell data. So they can do it for commercial purposes. They, they have done that, and they do that well for pedopornography uh, pictures on the internet. Why can't they do that more on uh, counterterrorism? So that's on removal. On counter-narrative, I fully agree with what Rachel and, and what uh, Jane said. We need to do more. And I pushed, uh, uh, during this year, uh, an ID, uh, again based on the British experience, uh, of people coming from the advertisement world. They know how to convince Jane to buy a, a shampoo from L'Oréal and not from Garnier. Uh, while it's exactly the same shampoo. So they are ex excellent. <laughs> now you tell us. <laughs> they segment the audience. They craft the message accordingly, right. and so forth. Uh, government are not doing that very well, and so we have now a team uh, supported by the European Union advising uh, our member states to develop a more strategic communication. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't believe a lot of the, uh, on the uh, digital outreach team of the State Department, or guy John Smith telling that he's challenging the, uh, the narrative on Internet. But I think government still have to improve. Um, if you look at the reason why Many Europeans went to Syria and Iraq at the outset, no, no longer uh, now. Uh, many had the feeling that the West was not supportive enough of the Syrian Spring. And so looking at TV and seeing all this ugly stuff, they thought they were, that was their duty as a Muslim to go there. So we have not been able to explain enough why, what we were doing. And by the way, if you look at the European Union, so far we have spent between 3 and 4 billion euro in humanitarian assistance. We don't tell people what we do, and we don't do that enough. And um, we, I, I turned to the commission, I said, why don't you explain better? And they said, we do. And they showed a lot of good publication, very costly publication. Nobody reads them. So it's just <laughs> to train government to be more effective in its communication. But beside government, it's mainly civil society. It's uh, uh, indeed uh, the society, uh, but we have to help society to be uh, effective on the Internet. And by the way, that's what some Internet companies are doing. They already train um, activists in, in civil society like they train the uh, team in the campaign of Obama in 2012. Uh, so we, do, we need to do that more. So that's the other part of what we want to discuss with the IT companies. How can they help us 
to um, train and, and instruct the civil society to be uh, more effective. Credible voice, formers, uh, victims, families, and so forth. And the last point, but I don't touch upon that, but it was quite telling to listen to the discussion yesterday, is uh, access, uh, access to consent uh, because of encryption. And not only that, for Europe, is to get e-evidence. Because we want to uh, bring these people to court, and we are not present in Syria. So the problem is that unless they leave electronic traces, uh, uh, how can we prove that they were fighting alongside ISIL and not with the Free Syrian Army? But we need to get access to the e-evidence, but most of them are stored in clouds in the US. And that requires MLA request. So we have different arrangements. We need to clean up a bit all this. On encryption, I was a bit disappointed yesterday to, to listen to the head of the NSA and other colleagues saying, we don't see a solution. Most of these companies, they developed and they are developing more and more sophisticated encryption devices because they want to secure their European market. We are fond of privacy and it's a marketing argument and they won't stop. And I see that uh, no one has a solution so far. Pub Public-private partnership and discussion is, is needed. So we try to work on this uh, forefront. That's uh, very interesting. Thank you. Um, Juliet, I wonder if you could talk a little bit from your experience, both working for the state of Massachusetts and the Department of Homeland Security, a little bit about uh, engaging uh, local populations right. in the United States and, and um, particularly in, in ways in which they can help identify potential problems or red flags and whatnot. Great. So before I went into federal government, I was the state of Massachusetts Homeland Security Advisor. So was very involved with these efforts before they were called countering violent um, uh, extremism. They were more community outreach efforts, just the sort of typical thing that law enforcement does with communities uh, that are either a majority community or a minority community. So let me just start from the beginning uh, about the US. There are about 5 million mu uh, Muslims in the United States, 5, 5.5, I think. Um, they're different, right? Um, most Muslims in America are from African descent. Most Arabs in America, like myself, are Christian. So to talk about some notion of what we think may be difficult. So that's the first point. The second is, only a handful of them are violent, right? If we ignore the five million that aren't, we're sort of ignoring their narrative. So I just wanted to make that, I'm sorry, I've been a little bit sick, so um, give me a second. Sorry. I'm the only person who gets sick in Aspen. Hold on. <laughs> um, so I may have to pass for a second, but so that's essentially the narrative I want to tell you. Five million people are not violent. And if we isolate them through this process, we may enrage those who are not enraged. And I do believe that if in the process of the CVE process, we um, isolate members of the population um, in ways that make everyone else outside the population feel like Muslims are in danger or are dangerous, I really believe in that way the terrorists have won. In other words, if they make us feel that the Muslim population is scary and you know, on the internet getting radicalized, that is bad, right? So we have to just, I just want to put that five million in context, just a handful of cases, just a handful of threats in the United States. So that's just sort of to put this in framework, but we have a threat and it would be stupid to deny it. And that threat has to be addressed on the sort of hometown level, not the sort of uber international level. We have a threat internally in the United States. And so how communities are addressing that is in a variety of ways because one size does not fit all. What is clear is that the movement of countering violent extremism is actually changed over time, or this, this government effort. Where it used to be focused on imams, right? So non-Muslims think, oh, I gotta go to the Muslim community, let's go to the imams. That is just no longer the case. The Muslim community is as diverse as any community. They are employed, they work at places like where you work, they are integrated into our society. That is the American success story. So our outreach efforts have to get beyond the imam and the mosque and actually engage Muslims in their own society, which is our society. And so that's the second point. So the change in sort of the tactics has now been that what we need to do is um, essentially recognize that the one thing that all the terrorist threats have had in common in the United States is not that they come from a similar background, not that they come from similar schools, not that they're from the East or West Coast. They actually have no common narrative except this. They are sons of mothers, they are sons of fathers, they are brothers, they have sisters, they have employees, they are integrated into our society. So by using the countering violent extremism effort, which is going on in all different communities, Detroit, Boston, um, 
New York, Florida, everywhere else. What we can do is actually engage all of the Islamic society, which is, as I said, not radicalized, uh, so that they can identify much better than the FBI, as, as Comey mentioned, much better than DHS, um, who within their ranks might be the one amongst five million who might be uh, radicalized. And by doing that, we have to do in a very careful effort for the government. We cannot speak for the Muslim community. I think what you guys, what you all were saying, that the one narrative that the United States is very good at is explaining that, uh, that ISIS and Al-Qaeda kill Muslims too. That is a very good narrative for the United States to constantly pounce on. But ultimately, it is the government either providing the resources to these communities, uh, making local and state law enforcement, public health, public safety officials uh, come to the table, talk to these communities, um, and do it really at the local level. Because in some ways, while we call it countering violent extremism, it's what a lot of you remember from the 1960s and 1970s. It, this is community policing. It is engaging communities at the very basic level. And so while what's happening at the State Department, what's happening at DHS, is very, very important to support these efforts. Remember, it's just happening at your local community. And so making sure that we support those efforts while recognizing that we don't want to harm uh, the integration of the Muslim community into our society in ways that are really truly an American success story as compared to many European countries, that that is ultimately our goal. Great. Well, thank you. So I'd like to open it up, and please, uh, all of you, feel free to jump in at this point. I'd just like to raise a couple of issues, and I'd like to pick up on something that, that Jill mentioned and, and that also, um, Jane, you were talking about, and that is the Internet. I mean, the, 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 the battle space really is the Internet. Um, and. I have a, a sort of a simple question, maybe Rashad being uh, our only representative of the U.S. government here, you can answer this, which is why can't we just crash their comms? Why can't we take them off of Twitter, take them off of Facebook? Just, you know, these guys are bad guys. They lop people's heads off. Uh, they have, uh, we, we'd like to just, just take, them out of, take them out of business on the Internet. Well, there, there is a process by which uh, the social media companies are upholding their own terms of service. So, you know, oftentimes this is thought of as kind of a heavy-handed approach where, you know, will a government come in and just uh, turn off uh, these sites, as is done in some countries. Uh, but actually, um, and I think you know, the, the others have alluded to this, is if you work with these companies, they will tell you that oftentimes the content that's going up is inconsistent with their own terms of service. I'm actually a lawyer by background. When I I started working um, in the White House. One of my jobs was to help negotiate terms of service by which the government could use some of these uh, social media accounts. You know, they have to be, di they have to be uh, uh, compliant with privacy laws, disability laws. And so you'll see that uh, companies are doing more and more uh, to actually uh, take down a lot of the, uh, of the, the content but it, that, but that's still, in violation of their It still of their seems laws. to be almost uncontested uh, battle space for, for the bad guys. I mean, they, they seem to have no problem whatsoever of, of putting their messaging out there, their beheading videos, which, what have you. Um, isn't there a way we can, we can do a better job of, of taking that down? Well, you'll see that the, the things like uh, beheading videos, those things come down almost immediately. Where you have difficulty is when uh, there is speech that is advocating uh, extremist ideas that might ne not necessarily cross the line into something illegal. Now, it may lead to activity, uh, by a recruit, but that's where it's really important to work in, in, in cooperation with the private sector, and this cannot just be a government approach. You know, when you talk about contesting the space, part of the challenge that we have is that if you, if you do a search for the term Daesh, which is the uh, pejorative Arabic term for ISIL, you will see, you know, you mentioned the number 90,000, you'll see more than 90,000. But the problem is, even though there's a lot of counter content out there, ISIL is able to capture uh, the media narrative, and they're able to be sensational because what is their, how do they produce content? You burn somebody in a cage, they drown somebody in a cage, shoot somebody in the head in slow motion, and boom, they've got their content. For others, that's not, that's not how we produce content. You will have a statement from somebody very credible, get them in front of a camera, you'll have an edict, but that statement or that edict is not going to resonate in the same way that a sensational image is going to resonate with the kid who's sitting in their basement that's already disaffected and they're looking for a sense of empowerment or something to be a part of. So there's, yeah. there's a quantitative aspect to this and there's a qualitative aspect to this that has to be cracked as well. Jane, I think yeah. you want to jump in here. Well, crashing their comms feeds their narrative. Uh, it martyrs them and they will find their way around it. They're enormously tech savvy. 
uh, but winning we, but the But we argument. invented Google. I yes. Mean, <laughs> well, I know we did. That's my pitch. Yeah. I mean, wh where are those guys? And by the way, we're missing, and I hope next year we'll have, uh, a conversation here with the tech community engaging the same material. We're also, we also ought to engage this encryption issue with the tech community here because it's complicated. And, and yes, they'll lose a lot of their customers if they can't prove that all, all communications are totally private, but they'll also lose their families if they can't give law enforcement legitimate access uh, to bad guys through, through communications that unfortunately are encrypted to law enforcement. So it's a complicated issue and we have to engage it and Aspen should engage it, in my view. But, but back to this. Uh, it is the war of ideas. Our country has a first, our constitution has a First Amendment, and we protect freedom of speech. And people have a right to read, in my view, not not how to make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom, which is actually on the internet, which is how the Boston Marathon guys learned how to do what they did successfully. Uh, but they have a right to read radical texts. What they don't have a right to do is to engage in rad in violent conduct, and we have to intercept them just at the point where. Uh, the reading or the engaging of radical conversation produces a motivation for them to engage in, in violent behavior. And that gray area is hard to find. Uh, while I was in Congress, for my 100 years in Congress, I authored a bill which uh, passed the House almost unanimously to put together a multidisciplinary committee uh, to advise Congress on how to find that gray area. And it passed overwhelmingly, went to the Senate, and all of a sudden, the civil liberties group said, no, 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 uh, this is uh, COINTELPRO. This is uh, hugely intrusive uh, in, in American values, and the thing was killed. I still think we need that kind of information to understand that gray area better. Jill? I think we need to do both. We need to increase the number of content we remove from internet. And I'm aware of the First Amendment. In Europe, we are divided on the same line, around the same line. We have member states where if you deny the Holocaust, uh, you will end up in a criminal court, while in other member states, you can say that and, and there is no problem. So we know the problem, but I think we can improve a lot. Some of the IT companies don't do enough. And that's what the Prime Minister of, of, of uh, Britain said in his speech. And so maybe EU first and EU US together, government together, in a partnership with the companies would put more pressure because we will never achieve a complete uh, cleaning of, of internet uh, of all these speeches. What we want to prevent is the, I would say, a vulnerable teenager uh, in his room who could get access and be confronted with this. Like we don't want to, uh, our teenagers to be confronted with pedopornographic picture. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's simple to understand. Mm -hmm. The real guy who's already radicalized will always go to the dark net. We'll not prevent that. So we want, that, that has to improve. And, and there are room for improvement. Just the speed of removal. Uh, frankly, please Google beheading on YouTube. You will still find hundreds of videos of beheading. Right. Of course, the two Americans who were beheaded have been removed in less than five minutes hmm. because the pressure was immense. But we still uh, can find on the internet Muslim uh, beheaded. It's terrible for their families. It's terrible for, uh, for them and for the society. So we should achieve the same for these people too. I'm sorry. Content narrative is probably uh, more promising, and we need to do more, as we've discussed before, but I would do both. I think yeah. I would not. Uh, uh, Julian, I'd like to pick, on, uh, pick up something that, uh, that you were talking about earlier, which is um, this concept of, of how you intercept and prevent uh, radicalization before uh, the major goes into the uh, army base and, and shoots um, 11 of his colleagues, or the shooter in Chattanooga um, uh, blows away uh, Marines and their recruiting bases. I mean, we've seen example after example in this country and, and all over the world now of, of these, and, and, and in retrospect, uh, we always look at these and we say, oh, well, that, that can be explained because he kind of went off the rails here or he was influenced by this website or that website or ISIS or Al Qaeda. Um, how do we, how do we get into that cycle and, and, and interrupt that cycle, if you will, in such a way that is more effective and that can spot some of these behavioral uh, changes that occur? Okay, so there's, let me answer with the radical answer, which is we won't. I mean, I think to a certain extent, given the terrorist threat, 
the way it looks now, we are just going to have to accept that there's going to be, let's say, 100, if there's 100 of them seeking to be radicalized and, get, and be violent, if we get 99 of them, that's a pretty good day for us and a great day for them. So, so the zero-sum game is not going to happen, but how do you minimize risk? So it's just a combination of things, and just what I was saying before, and, and to your question, Chris, uh, to, the idea that there is a typical narrative that explains what's happening out there in the world is just false. Um, each of these incidents that we've seen, you look back, some are a combination of mental illness, some are uh, alienation from Islam, some are uh, sort of a, a acceptance of a radical Islam notion. Um, so there's a, so we can sort of look at every case differently and learn from them. So there's a couple things. One is, as you said, ev someone knew in the community, and that's why these countering violent extremism sort of local efforts are really, really important at this stage, because what you want to say to the Muslim community or any community is law enforcement is here to protect you, to protect your community, and to protect your son or daughter or whoever might be radicalized. So that means we have to break down the divisions between law enforcement, intelligence agencies, and com diverse communities in this country. It is hard in this country. Uh, some of the um, post 9-11 aspects, as many of you, right, you know, it alienated the Arab and Muslim communities in some ways. Those ha are now getting more ameliorated. Um, and it's also hard because of our immigration policy. It's just anytime you go to one of these meetings, as I do, immigration policy always comes up because people are deported rightfully uh, or legally. And so those issues will come up in these discussions. The, the second area, and I just want to pick up on this counter narrative, the, the ISIS's narrative, at least in the US, if, if you look at some of these websites, is not necessarily the beheadings. It's what we call a jihad chic. Um, it is life is sexy over there. It is get out of your humdrum life in Detroit or your humdrum life in, in New York and have a really cool husband who uh, knows how to you know, use weapons or get four wives and have a car. And so what we need is that counter narrative that life really is hell and you will die uh, if you go over there. And I think that it's important, therefore, that we have to think differently about these formers. Um, you know, we would think we'll arrest them, right? You know, how could they do this? And I think we have to actually find a way, a creative way, in which they become our spokespeople. Say, I left here and I went there and, and it was awful. Um, and so it's not just the beheadings and the violence, it's this chic thing that is going on that's actually as scary and very appealing to, to teenagers, but um, that's essentially well, it. And we won't be, let's just be clear, we will not be totally successful. Yeah. Well, I, th I think you're right about the zero sum game. I, I, we, we only have 10 minutes left, so I, I wanna open it up to the floor. Uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. Uh, please um, stand, identify yourself, wait for the microphone and ask a question. Really, we, we don't have that much time, so uh, we prefer questions to statements. Sir. Thank you, I'm Mark Trebelli, one of the Aspen Scholars. Uh, to Mr. Hussain, to what extent are de-radicalization efforts being incorporated into state strategy? And then to Mr. Kirchhoff, it seems, as Ms. Kahn pointed out, that relative to the US, European Muslim communities are far more isolated. Um, do you agree with that perception, and what are the causes, and how can we fix that? Yeah, well, our particular operation uh, focuses on you know, getting out the positive narrative, putting out the, the counter messaging along the lines that uh, we've spoken about, and then working with governments and non-governmental organizations um, on a number of initiatives. And some of our partners overseas are focusing on uh, de-radicalization efforts. Uh, there's an interesting point that Juliet brought out about formers. And I, I, I would say you, you still arrest them and you still prosecute them, but just like in other criminal contexts, you know, whether it's a drug context or, or gang context, you have prosecutorial discretion for those that cooperate in the sense of, I'm gonna get out there and tell my story, I'm gonna record a statement about how bad life was actually under ISIL through that type of cooperation. Yes, you're still gonna go to jail, but perhaps um, the, the scenario is a little bit different than if the person doesn't cooperate at all. So there are definitely de-radicalization programs out there, some uh, more effective than others. You look at the recidivism rate in a typical criminal context and you know, uh, the numbers are, uh, are different, different places, but in some places they may be half. Whereas in de-radicalization, we've seen that in some cases they're much lower than that. Now, the impact is still uh, <clears throat> significant because even if you have one person uh, who goes back to the battlefield, the impact of that is, is, is significant if they go back to terrorist activity, whereas you know, going back to other types of crimes may not be uh, as significant, but those are all important areas to take a look at. Yeah, I have a yep. question. Oh, she'll head. 
Oh, sorry, Gilles, uh, just, sorry, yes. You, uh, I think you're right. Uh, in average, the American Muslim are better off and better than in, in, in Europe to problem of integration, second and third generation. And we have to develop policies, but they should not be linked to counterterrorism. It would be a big mistake. So I usually distinguish with what I call CT related. That's what we are discussing. It's really to prevent radicalization leading to terrorism. And a soft policy, contextual policy, where you improve the way uh, or Muslim uh, Europeans are feeling, they develop in, in society, it's the fight against discrimination, it's a lot of policies of, in terms of education, urban development, uh, integration, so, but that has to happen, but it should be completely disconnected from... I mean, one of the problems CD5. with the counter-narrative is that, as I think Rashad pointed out earlier, is that there are legitimate grievances in the right. Muslim world, True. such as Syria, where people see uh, day after day, these images of uh, brutal uh, barrel bombing and chemical weapons attacks and young children being killed and, and most of them being Sunnis uh, and most of them being civilians and they see the world doing little to nothing about it and that, that certainly yeah. is a factor. So it's, it's also important to remember that there's a, a range of, a comprehensive approach that's needed here from sh short term, immediate term to long term. In the immediate term, you have military action, which is necessary, because if ISIS is allowed to expand, then that feeds into their narrative that they are a divinely inspired group of people that is able to control territory, take more territory. Also in, in the immediate realm is the counter-messaging. Um, but then there's also, in the less immediate realm, you have to have uh, social intervention, uh, engagement along the lines of what we've spoken about on this panel. And then it is important to address the fact that this is stemming from an ideology a lot of this activity. And if you don't address that ideology, then you solve the problem in one place, but then it appears somewhere else. And so you have to, over the long term, address some of those factors. And of course, you know, I, I, don't, I think you can be criticized fairly for saying that that's the only part of it that you have to address. No, that, that is one important part uh, of, of the strategy, but again, from the immediate term, the military action, the counter messaging, and then engagement, social intervention, criminal prosecution, and uh, prevention. All of these uh, have to be used because, as I said, it's a generational challenge but, and it's-, it's But it's, every yeah. day, there are hundreds of kids in their basements, and they're not all Muslim, uh, looking at awful stuff that is gonna cause them, or some of them, uh, to engage in violent behavior. Some of them are white supremacists and neo-Nazis. Sure. And let's understand that some in the Muslim community in Europe particularly are also vicious anti-Semites. And so this thing builds on itself. Sure. And uh, maybe I'm a politician, a recovering politician, and maybe I'm old, <laughs> but I think we need to do things now. It is a long problem, but we need to do things now. We need to show action, visible action, to contain ISIL on the ground. And I, I mentioned that before, and you just said the same thing, Rashid. And we need to get the tech companies to help us get in the faces and in the pockets where the Twitter handles are vibrating of these kids. And I don't think this is rocket science. I think it is the kind of technology challenge that they meet every single day. And, and our government and our citizens ought to be out there demanding that. And I do hope there will be a forum soon. Maybe we'll do it at the Wilson Center yeah. on, the, on engaging technology with this No, I crisis. think that's a great idea. Jim. In telegraphic terms, two aspects. It's not only Muslim. Uh, the foreign fighters in Europe, we have more and more converts, uh, up to 40%. Uh, Christian, Jews, Bud even Buddhist. So this is one issue. And the other one, which is linked up a bit what I'm say, uh, I said about CT relevant, uh, CV relevant and, and internet, there is a, a, a great program that President Obama uh, has announced, which is called the Stevens uh, Virtual Exchange Program, which tries to connect one million teenagers in the West and the Arab world through internet. And I would like the EU to do the same, one million by 2020. Uh, it is very, very effective. It's like all program in Europe called Erasmus. It contributes a lot to remove stereotypes. And you, if you connect a class in the south of Cairo and a class in Aspen, for one year, the same teacher, geography or history, for the first two months, they will have stereotypes towards each other. Uh, the Jews, the conspiracy, a lot of conspiracy theory in the Middle East. But after two months, they will realize they love the same songs, the same uh, uh, ideas. And, and, and I think it's, it's a quite useful uh, mechanism. We that's should a, very, that's a very interesting uh, idea. Um, in the back, Ambassador. Uh, Lokman Fahil, Iraq Ambassador. Uh, I will make an assumption and say, unless somebody understands the root causes, then any action you take might be less effective. 
And they'll also make an assumption and say, where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, at the conference, everybody talked about the short fuse of radicalization, uh, violence in a sense of recruitment, self-recruitment, and then taking an action. And what I hear today is primarily more of a reaction and firefighting. My question is, do you think in the United States and European have the will for understanding the root causes and do they have the tenaciousness of the marathon run required for resolving these issues? Rashad, I'll let you uh, handle yeah, that I mean, one. As I was just mentioning, there is, there is an immediate uh, uh, aspect of this problem that has to be dealt with in a very decisive way right now. And you have military action that's taking place. You have counter-messaging that's taking you place. You said it was the ideology. What, what, what is time, that ideology? At the same time, you do have uh, a warped ideology which is playing off of themes uh, that people exploit uh, and warp and draw people towards. And here it's important to remember that this is not going to be just one government or the United States that can deal with this problem. To the extent that you have countries that are allowing this uh, ideology to spread and this ideology, ideology to be exported, we're going to continue to have this problem on our hand. And so part of what uh, we're doing and what we need to continue to do more of is work with countries uh, to make sure that they're not allowed to, that this ideology is not allowed to be exported, but then at, very fundamentally, uh, to go to the question, there's a breakdown in education in, in many parts of the Muslim world, both religious education and secular education. Secular education, when you have people that are illiterate, they don't have access to information uh, that they can use to deconstruct uh, the, their narratives that are out there. They don't, in their religious education, when it's slanted in a certain way, they can't, they don't ha they're not equipped to say, look, there's verses in the Quran that say, you know, for example, if you kill one person, innocent person, as if you've killed all of humanity. Now, I've seen people make these types of arguments to so-called, you know, uh, to, to radicals, and they just, they can't answer oftentimes very basic points when, 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 they, when there's counter arguments from within the tradition that are put toward them. And so you have to have uh, a long-term solution in addition to uh, the very immediate necessary steps which we we're talking about. Part of that, uh, the president, when he hosted the, the, the White House summit uh, on countering violent extremism, part of, it, of, of the purpose of that is to make sure that we're getting to those solutions as well, but that we're working with the private sector and non-governmental actors and those that have more agility uh, to address these problems. Uh, Ambassador, I wanted to just follow up on your question. The, I often say that homeland security is as much about security as it is about the homeland. And just to describe, um, root causes are important, but when you actually get to the homeland and how these processes work, in a state like mine, um, I oversaw 351 cities and towns, uh, 299 police departments, ranging from the Boston police, totally sophisticated, gets it, to other places, which I won't mention, less so. Um, so that Homeland Security funding or State Department funding or anything for these efforts is going to be, that's my lowest common denominator. I don't mean to denigrate them. I, what I mean to say is what they are good at is community engagement. Not all police departments, we certainly know that from Ferguson, but what police departments are trained on is integrating with their communities. Part of that means they understand what's going on, they know what's going on in different religious institutions, and I think by sort of reminding ourselves that while this is scary and new, um, and the root causes issue won't be addressed by the police chief of a small town in Massachusetts, uh, there are aspects to um, engaging the community that are quite familiar, and that should actually give us at least some optimism at a time when it seems very, very scary. But that's essentially the, you know, the governance structure that DHS is working with um, when, it, when it has a policy or NCTC or whoever else has a policy. It's getting down to that basic level. We can create a, a sort of common operating picture, um, but the bigger questions of the fight within Islam, you're, you're not going to get it, um, you know, with the local police department. I think we're, we're, we're really out of time here. Uh, so I, I want to thank the panel. Uh, it's been a very interesting, uh, enlightening. I'm not sure we solved the problem, but uh, thank you very much.
appreciate you spending three days over. Thank you.